We are dreamers, frontline workers, students, visionaries, healthcare workers, bankers, engineers, educators, designers, nurses. We're multi passionate people, dog lovers, podcasters, food golfers, we're hardworking, blue collar, loving, loyal. We are advocates. We're the sons and daughters of Lansing. Moms. Dads. Friends. Neighbors. We are family. We are tradition. We are perseverance. We are resilient. We are old. We are young. We are the future. We are fans. We are supporters. We are smoking bubbles. We are soccer. We are football. <laughs> we are a community club. Community focus. Community owned. And we are community built. This is Lansing's Club. Lansing's Club. Lansing's Club. Lansing's Club. We are Lansing Common FC. Lansing Common FC. Lansing Common FC. Lansing Common Football Club. We are Lansing Common FC. Let's go. Robin needed a podcast, and thus, here we are. Welcome to the best and only Lansing Soccer Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Weston Shelton, and we have a win to discuss, folks. Uh, four to nothing win over Lansing Common FC, or over Inter Detroit. Jesus. Lansing. Uh, not even a minute in fucking up. I'm off, I'm off to a rip, roaring start, baby. Um, and with the, per- yeah, it's because like Cam makes me nervous. You know, when he's here, I'm like, oh man, it's Cam. <laughs> he's, he's such a big deal. Plus he'll rip me if I screw up. So that makes me screw up. It's a whole thing. Uh, let's take you around the table. Uh, first off, that is uh, the Lansing soccer legend now in Portland, not Portland, Michigan. Cameron Tanner, what's up, Cam? How's it going? How are how are things in Portland? Uh, sunny, drier than expected, more expensive, but you know, <laughs> missing y'all. You are uh, off in the back there. You were you were able to stay closely attuned to the team, thanks to uh, thanks to our amazing broadcast. So props to Scott Overlander. Just wanted to give him some shouts. Um, we're also joined by uh, Jeff Sykes, who we have a still picture of. You'll just have to live with it. You can't see Jeff live. I know everyone's bugged. How you doing, Jeff? Oh, you know, computer troubles are fun. But, uh, you know, glad to be talking about a win and a, a pretty good performance on a good day. So. Absolutely. I'm assuming your latest uh, kit design was just so mind-blowing it just crashed your whole computer. Yeah, no, I don't even, I can't even, my home computer, like, just get, has been working from home so much through the pandemic that, like, it's on vacation, apparently. Like, as soon as I'm, I'm now back in the office and it's just decided it doesn't want to work anymore. So, um, <laughs> that that's just uh, where we're at. Uh, so, that's Jeff, the VP. Um, so, when you hear a disembodied voice, that's him. The other disembodied voice is the People's Board member, Steve Beckman, producing the show. How's it going, Steve? I'm good. I didn't put up a still image of myself, so just pretend that I look like Jeff. <laughs> yes, this week, a uh, play-by-play commentator for Lansing Common FC, Naomi San Diego, he's a Michigan State journalism major. The People's Board member, Luca Steve Maloney. Beckman. How's it going, Luca? Hey, Weston, thank you for having me on today. Absolutely. You're here. You know, we try to have someone in the journo spot. Um, some big names have come before you, but I know you'll live up to them. Uh, like Phil Friend and uh, and your your partner, Cameron. Uh, but yeah, we, we'll have some more questions for you to uh, drill down on your past a little later. Um, and if you're more interested in Luca, he also had a nice interview with the Michigan Soccer Central podcast earlier this week. Um uh, before we uh, get into the the game, the four nothing victory. Just real quick, just want to hype uh, our upcoming match, uh, June twenty sixth. It's Pride Night against B I H. So if you don't have tickets, get them. Um, we also have a Pride shirt for sale on Lansing Common FC website. Um, all proceeds go to Rebel House Fitness. So it's uh, it's a good cause. It's going to be a, a fun night. 
episode. Uh, get your tickets, and once, like I say every week, bring some friends. Let's uh, let's get things going. I think I think the Sunday day games are harder for at least some people, and you, you know you got to deal with more heat. So back to uh, more Saturday late evening. So hopefully that uh, helps bring out a big crowd. Um, any, anything else we should hype before we start, Steve? Uh, we do also have a pride raiser going between the Lansing Common Supporters Group and the, the Ransom for Lansing United. I believe we're around $100 per goal for the month. Yeah, of June, right and we're we're racking it up. We, we could use more, though. And, I mean, look, I'll warn you. The way some Lansing soccer teams are playing right now, it's going to cost you. <laughs> Money is going to be flowing off those pledges. But that's, that is a good thing, obviously. <laughs> All right. Let's get into it. Um, four nothing victory, huge win. I, I would dare say a must win game for Lansing, and, and they absolutely delivered. Um, we're gonna start with breaking down the goals as always. Uh, 14th minute, we had our first one. Uh, Inter Detroit was offside in the Lansing half. Kyle Scott is there and sees that Inter's defense is not really set up and astutely plays the ball ahead to Ty Uziak. He's one on one with the defender, and second a second defender kind of shades towards Ty. Ty explodes past this man and finds a wide open Shetty Omar making a run down the middle who taps it in just in time. Not the first time we'd see Ty scorch defender and not the first Shetty goal we'd see. Um, Lucas, I'm sure Oaks was happy to see that so early getting off to a good start. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the keys to the game was getting an early start, just like they've been doing before. But the most important thing was they can they know they can get the first goal. The question was, can they get the second goal and also hold back on inner Detroit, not getting any shots on target on the other end? Uh, do you have anything to throw in on that one, Cam? Shetty, as you can see, is down after. Took took a hit. Uh, went out for a little bit. I know we were chatting. We were a little concerned, but he, he came back a few minutes later. Yeah, well, I was I was interested in uh, kind of watching from afar the uh, concussion protocol. Um, seeing, seeing if he was going to come back in the game. I don't know what MP and the league ha has as far as uh, their protocols, but that was what stood out to me because it's always it's always troubling when you see someone stay down in, in that moment and, and knowing that uh, Shetty does like to celebrate, so you're not really expecting him after a goal like that to be on the ground for long if everything's good. Yeah, we don't have concussion tents, I don't think. Maybe it's in the works for next season. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he, I, I guess I didn't even see it before, but man, he really gets leveled there at the end. So I, I'm, I'm happy he was okay. And obviously he was okay enough to score some more goals later on. Um, but the, uh, the next goal would also be him in the, in the 36th minute, but it was, is set up by a PK. Um, Trevor Togi got subbed in pretty early and he made an impact pretty quickly. Um, he pounces on an, a slightly heavy touch from an inner Detroit player as they built up. Intercepts the ball, immediately gets on the run, gets past his man, plays a nice ball up to Ty Uziak on the wing. One-on-one -on -one again. I think they're a little nervous. Uh, so he, as he starts to blow by him, even though he takes a heavy, heavier touch, they take him down and he drew the PK. Um, nice play from Ty there, Jeff. Yeah, Ty was Ty was a problem for Inter all, all match. Uh, it, it probably hit. And it's funny that you mentioned Togi as well, because I think both Togi and Uziak had like their best games in, in Lansing Common shirts. Um, Uziak especially, we, we knew he was a threat, and especially over the top, but he kind of he he did he worked it in different ways and still kind of got to the same end result. And the end result is burning defenders. And I mean it, it that part was fun to watch on the rewatch. So yeah, I Great, great pen. I mean, that's what desperate defenders do is they'll make bad challenges and uh, took advantage of it. And, uh, you know, Shetty steps up, confident as ever, and, and buries it. Uh, Cam, uh, when I, in our chat live, you said it was a learning experience for that defender. I mean, yeah. I, I you, you said maybe a bit nervous there, um, but when I was watching it, I, there, there was no reason – uh, to take him down that it was cover you you said it was a heavy touch so I don't I don't know what the communication looked like there with the with the keeper in the back line um, Uziak showed showed his speed in, in getting in into a good position but the ball was too far ahead of him for for that tackle to even need to be thought about so 
And Watch after that, replay, maybe he'll he'll listen a little more for for his keepers. <laughs> I want him off of that, but. And you, and you can see on the video there, Shetty confidently put the PK home after that. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about this because we had a PK against Inter on the road, and that was uh, Louis Shefku who took that one. But Shetty got uh, subbed off somewhat early in that match. So uh, I assume, I, I don't know if you've, if uh, Oaks has talked to you, Luca, about like PK strategy for the team, but I assume. If he's out there, Shetty's the man who's getting the PKs this year. Yeah, I mean, the most important thing in taking penalties is not just being the one who's going to be on target, but who's going to be more confident when stepping up to the plate when when the opportunity arises. And Shetty is the, one of the most confident players in this team alongside some other guys. And it's no question for me that he's the guy who stepped up to take it because he got the goal on fire. And this guy just likes to score goals, and he lives for the moment. No question about it. Yeah, I, I know. For, so for Lansing Ignite, we had a lot of discussion about PKs because there's a couple shaky moments. And in general, it was our striker Pato, but you could, like someone else, if, if, if they could convince him, he could let it up. And a couple times that backfired. So for me, I just want Shetty lining up every time. I don't care who drew it. I don't care what happened. He's the guy with the confidence. And obviously he showed the ability there to put him home. So um, uh, that's something to keep an eye on whenever he's out there. And when he's not out there, who's, who's the next guy. Uh, and, but yeah, I, I, going back to the buildup too, I think you kind of touched on it, Jeff, but I thought Togi had one hell of a game. Cause, uh, I, I'm curious if this was planned, uh, cause Russell came out pretty early and Ru- Russell's been very strong. I've been probably the number one Russell advocate on the, on this pod, but I thought he, he was just kind of invisible. Uh, most of the that first 30 minutes or so until he got subbed out. And I mean, Togi really showed me something this week. I, I don't know if you heard anything uh, about Togi from Oaks in the last week or two, Luca. Yeah, no, Togi trains every week. He's done exceptional things, especially when they play little scrimmages. He's usually the one who gets the goals and brings the energy. For me, Esteban Russell really had a difficult time getting past that le- that wide right defender of Inter Detroit. And he- and a couple of times, Dante Morissette tried to find him on that on that run. And Esteban Russell just didn't have the legs to keep up with the player and the ball. So it made sense to me when Trevor Togi came in. And Oaks has been getting more was getting more comfortable with using Togi in that central midfield role. And he even mentioned to us in the last game against Grand Haven, even though Togi is a more attacking midfield style, he played the number six role and then the Regista deep lying midfield role really well. And in a difficult situation, he's not the tallest player. He's not the strongest one, but he's the quickest. He's one of the quickest on the ball. Yeah, he's – and I thought Oaks is – I think as he's learned this team, he's really starting to do a good job of, like, pressing the right buttons at the right time because when Russell came out, I wasn't sure if that was just kind of planned because I feel like he tends to play Russell less minutes. Not that he's old, you know, but I guess for this league, he's kind of old. <laughs> so uh he, he pushed the right buttons there and, and that was key in that goal happening um second half lansing kept it going three nothing 55th minute uh corner kick by noah canlis it's low and kind of awkward <laughs> bounces through multiple defenders and just kind of magically finds uh burge right in front of that and puts it home his second goal of the year uh jeff i mean one man's trash is another man's treasure. I, I don't know. Yeah, that there, there's like there's like the beautiful goals, and then there's the uh, the uh, you know not so beautiful goals. And Burge is ju- just finding the not so pretty ones this season. Yes, um, absolutely, <laughs> and it, it's it, it's great. I lo- my fa- honestly my favorite part of any Julian goal is is watching him celebrate because he 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 celebrates like. It's his first one ever, and he doesn't know what to do, and I love it. <laughs> well, less less planning and less orchestration around his cellies there. It's just like, pure raw Shetty, motion. Shetty, you know, has been thinking about what he's going to do on his next goal. Like, he has it planned. He has it choreographed. He, 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 he's ready to do it. Julian is like, oh, my gosh, I scored. What do I do? So he's like, maybe tries three different ones and eventually just settles on something, and it's, it's great. But, yeah. Honestly, I'm surprised the ball got through all the defenders to get there. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, 
good, good, good players find the ball in that situation, put it home. So I love I mean, that point, Jeff. I love it so much because Shetty truly is like the Terrell Owens of our team. Like he has like friggin' six celebrations queued up at any time, like ready to go. And and Julian Burge is like the fifth string wide receiver who like never expects to find the end zone. And he's just like it's just pure joy when he scores. And but you know, you gotta get impressed for being in the right place at the right time and being ready, even though his goals haven't been beautiful. You know, they got the veteran stuff going. Uh, Cam, you you had a point to make. I mean, to go back to like saying you you don't expect that ball to get through. And that's kind of one of the things that's interesting as I'm out here watching these um, streaming these matches, because a lot of the time I'm, I'm still right now streaming them back to back with like the Euros or um, I'm watching a, an MLS match and or a national team match and then going to there. Um, so like, yeah, should that ball have gotten through? Probably not. But over the course of the season, like we've seen quite a few of those. And at this level, you're going to see a lot more of those getting through than at higher levels. And you need to be able to, to be ready at this level more than, than other levels for those balls uh, to just end up at your feet, even though there's three, four five people between you and the ball that probably should have gotten to it. Um, so I'm happy to see that, that Burgess is, is getting on the end of those ugly goals. Um, and we have those people who aren't, whether they've played at a higher level and they're not expecting it. And so the ball, the ball gets them in that position and they're just not ready for it or um, whatever reason, they're just not um, ready to pounce on, on any situation where the little ball comes to you. So. Um, and then fourth goal, uh, 78th minute. Uh, Steve, Eric clipped a lot of stuff I, for us. I don't know if that's what we want to roll with. It was, it's pretty long, uh, but here it is. It's up there. You can watch all the buildup because Eric just loves buildup. Uh, but, um, but in the end, we ended up with Dante Morissette on the wing, who just plays an incredible ball to Josh Rosendale, making a run down the middle of the field. Uh, Rosendale makes a touch to try and get past the defender, but the defender takes him down to avoid the opportunity a potential one-on-one and ends up getting yellow carded. Josh was not happy with this call. I think we were talking a little before. I think most of us agree. Probably should have been a red, but uh, uh, Luca, what'd you think of the buildup and uh, that last ball by Morissette? Oh, buildup was excellent. Uh, slow possession, but again, finding that open space, Morissette takes one great touch and finds that diagonal ball to Rosendale, who's making an excellent run down the wing. And yeah, it should have been a red card. We talked about it after the match with Cam and I and the coaches because all, all Rosendale needed was one more touch and he's threw onto the goal. And goalkeeper's not going to come out rushing 20 yards in t- less than two seconds. So he's in on goal no matter what. Should have been a red card, but hey, they capitalized on that option. Uh, we'll talk about the free kick that occurred after this in a second, but um, was there a goal that like Oaks was seen most excited about after the game, Luca? Cause I feel like maybe this buildup might be something he was, he was pretty pumped about. Oh yeah. No, the, definitely the goal after the free kick, you could see him pumping his fist in the air and just having a jolly old time. And he honestly, after the game, he, when Omar subbed out, he gave him a big hug, talked to him for like three minutes and he was just ecstatic with the way Omar's performance went on and really the entire team. Are, are you guys watching like a screen often with like what's in front of you or, or are you mostly just kind of looking down on the field and observing all the stuff around it too? Uh, me personally, I'm just looking at the field. The screen that we have is just a little, is just a, like a half a second off. And sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to see in real time what's going on just because the brightness is a little low. And when it's a hot day, you just, I, I just look outside the window. Like well, I said, that's where, that's where you find some of the good info like that. Cause even from the supporter section, like you can't really see, you know, that side of the field. So that's awesome insight. Um, and yeah, then right after that, Shetty puts home the hat trick, beautiful free kick, gets past the wall. Obviously that's the spot the keeper's kind of expecting to be covered. So he's not quite ready for it. Puts it home. Um, Jeff, we've talked several times, like who's a superstar in this team. And, you know, I don't, I, Shetty had kind of a slow start to the season, but I mean, this was a, once again, a superstar performance, no? I mean, if if anybody in, like, Lansing amateur soccer history is probably the most the most perfect for, for that title, I think I, it might be Shetty because he has, like, the whole 
whole package. Like he plays with flair. He has great work ethic and can score both of the goals. And I mean, he's just like the personality is there. So I think, I think Shetty is superstar level for sure. And honestly, yeah, that was a, it was an amazing free kick. Probably one of the nicest ones I've seen in, in Lansing soccer. Um, yeah, that, it was, it, it was funny. Like I, I was sitting there. This is the only goal watching live that I was a- actually able to see. It was close to the merch table. It was. And <laughs> I saw him step up. I'm like, I, 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 I turned to somebody who was there, who was there. And I was like, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to score this. Cause like you, 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 he just had a, he just had that confidence when he went up to take it. And, and I, I kind of, heard heard oaks talking after the game that but yeah he's this is something he's been really working on and he, he really wanted it so i i would yeah, like, i want to point yeah, out ahead. i want to point out at the end of this clip rosendale runs into the box as the kick is taken he picks the ball up out of the goal hands it into the goalkeeper's face and runs away <laughs> yes oh yes great find josh was very worked up this game. He he was kind of getting the shaft on a few calls. I think one foul on him, and then like right after, he gets taken down and doesn't get the card he should have gotten. So I think I think he he had an edge to him. Uh, the keeper, here. The keeper even boots it right at him. <laughs> that, that's really good. What a fu- you know there was uh, Josh was out there at the end of the the away game when there was some tension. I I don't know if he was at all part of that tension, but. Wouldn't shock me. I will say that goalie was not the one that was out there when uh, we played him too. So um, it's, I don't think they have history. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's no mullet here. There's no mullet here. Uh, Cam, if, if you'll uh, let me do this little ignite reference, the vibes I got from this goal was that five, nothing uh, Lansing went against Tucson when Toomey put home the free kick at the end of the game, just kind of as just an extra, extra little bit of fun. That was that was the vibes I got. Uh, no, I I like the the ignite reference. Uh, I, I think I liked this one a little bit more though because um, Inter is they're just fucking assholes. Uh, so it <laughs> feels it feels better to put those on at the end. Like Tucson wasn't wasn't nearly as chippy. There, there's not that that total just like lack of discipline. So like if we could have put four goals in in the last five minutes and just said, fuck you, that would have been just, I'd be perfectly pleased with it. But yeah. I, know, I, I get where you're going. Nicer but. team. So, Luca, this is why um, you and Cam got put into the role you're in. Cause if me and Cam, Cam or Tanner were in the booth, we'd be like, these fucking assholes. <laughs> so pro- props on your professionalism. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> the difference between a podcast and real, real stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you think we'd keep it professional the whole time, huh? Um, all right. So that was it for the scoring. 4 nothing. I feel like I should know it should have been 5 nothing. Uh, a ball definitely crossed the line. I believe it was from Togi um, off a pass from Ty. So it should have been 5 nothing. Just yeah, say. that screenshot maybe, for me. Maybe like 6, too. Yeah. Oh, well, there was the, the uh, Kyle Scott post shot. Where he, I mean, he, he had one hell of an open shot. And there was a goal line save after Dante Morissette's header. It, it could have been XG. It could have been yeah, seven. It could have been seven or eight. Yeah. It, Cam and I talked about this. We had to, we hit the post like three times, two to three times. Goal. There was a goal line save. A great save against Togi. It was just unbelievable the amount of shots that weren't firing. I mean, I think our goals probably matched up with our XG, but. Getting to like four and XG is pretty crazy. So say it one more time. <laughs> um, so let's a couple of big topics. Um, so look, this was a very uh, needed win for the table um, because a we'll talk more about must win games later. But uh, you know, there is a team at the top that I'm, I'm nervous about that doesn't look like they're going to lose anytime soon. So we really can't lose. Um, but Inter Detroit had played the day before, so it's worth noting. I don't know how many you know. No matter how big the roster is, I'm, that's a challenge, right? So um, it's just a game you have to win. You have to win big. Like, coming in, I was like, we really better have a three-goal win. Like, I, I felt that way. I was like, it should be three goals because, A, we're the better team. We're at home. And they played yesterday. So they, they took they took advantage. Um, yeah, I mean, every match this year, including the wins, I feel like there's been caveats. You know, you hear Oaks talking at 
after the game and he's um, maybe not that excited even after the wins he's kind of like eh, you know we have a lot to work on but I don't think he complained a lot this week and Jeff alluded to that earlier but uh well first Luca your conversation with Oaks I was I assume he was pretty pleased after this one Luca's Zoom is frozen for a second. Oh, man. Well, Luca talked to Oaks after the game, so he would have the insight. But uh, well, we'll just shoot it to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, what, do you, what was it this week that you think made everything come together so well? Uh, I just – honestly, it just felt like the team was in, like, the right frame of mind throughout the day. Um, I, the, being there as guys arrived, like, they seemed, it, they seemed confident. Um, I heard rumors of an extra day of practice this week just to kind of, uh, you know, help help get the team's mindset right and work on some some stuff that was holding them back. And I think for the most part, a lot of them were were solved. There's there's still some issues connecting passing and, and stuff, but they definitely played with much more confidence and really took the game to their opponents instead of kind of the other way around um and then just individual performances obviously i think togi togi yuziak and shetty all had like monster performances and and games so um that that helps i think the back line stood strong they weren't they weren't i don't think it was actually the best backline performance but it was a very very solid backline performance and potential to get even better which is like awesome and mind-blowing to me so I, th- I think the team this week really seemed to, to to get their minds right I think that's that's where the where the you see the, the improvement in the result I'll be talking to you more about the back line in a second Jeff um Luca you you talked Oaks after the game I, I assume this was the most pleased that he has been. Uh, and did he have any complaints? Cause I, I know even after the wins, he's had complaints this, this every, pretty much every match so far. It's not much as complaints as to how he wants the game to be run because there were increments in between the first half and second half in which inner Detroit started gaining more momentum and they were retaining the ball and attacking more for a big stretch of minutes. And Oaks highlighted that this is one of the things that has to be kept to a minimum because in games where you're one goal up or two goals up, it could change the story with them getting one good attack and finishing it. And he wanted to minimize the amount of time they have on the ball. And he thought they did today the best job at retaining that possession and not giving anything away. He said, he told me that one of the things he liked the most was not giving away lazy passes, which has been the story for many of these games and players just giving the ball away unnecessarily. Uh, Cam, any thoughts on why everything came together so well this week? I mean, the, the first thing that just comes into my mind is like we we started much later than than most other teams. Um, so when we say comes together, is it is it um, in the context of other other folks have had? Uh, more of the opportunity to to gel and, and gain that confidence with each other. I mean, I think that's probably part of it. I, I'm not the one that's going to be able to tell you. I haven't had a conversation with the players or the coaches um, to tell you, like, if something concrete did happen uh, that, that made things come together. But that's where I would speculate. Um, the further we get into the season, I think when we looked at our roster, we have one that should be competing uh, to, to win um, this division. And I thought that we might see some early hiccups just because of uh, the fact that some others had a head start on us and and getting a little extra training in early. Yeah. I have no problem with reckless speculation. So, okay, let's just go. Let's just guess. Reckless. That was (laughs) well-founded, rational. Like, fuck you. No, I'm saying I'm ready to do some reckless speculation myself. I, I, Oh, here we go. What's what's your magic. uh... (laughs) So, 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 so let's go here. So first off, I think he just figured out the right starting lineup. Like I, I when when it was posted, I mean, I know Josh Adam um, couldn't make a lot of the first few games, but you know he's in there. Uh, Russell starting like just, and he's figured out the Shetty tie thing over time. Like 
he's he's seen enough games, seen enough training. He just kind of, I think he just kind of knows what works now, and he, and he has a great lineup in there. So he, he's starting there, and then he knows who he has off the bench. He said the Togi move was probably the move of the match for him because he said Russell, like Luca talked about earlier, kind of just had a tough time this week, wasn't as involved. Um, enter Togi immediately makes an impact, immediately helps create a goal. Um, you know, but then, and then I think just the natural, like you said, Cam, they're starting later. They're starting to gel better. Um, you know, I mean, some of, some of these guys that was like, Oh, is Shetty not as good as we hoped is Ty not as good as we hoped. These, these guys are all coming around and, and Oaks is able to push the right buttons at the right time. Rosendale's another guy who's being used well as a sub and coming in and making an impact. Like there's just a lot of pieces on this team and, you know, it, summer leagues are awkward. They, they start mm-hmm. and you kind of, off and running and he it takes some time to figure everything out and uh, i think oaks is figuring out things and the team's figuring things out um i talked i talked about josh adam uh jeff you've been so hyped for this combo and now you've seen it a few times have they lived up to your own hype not yet but i am nowhere near writing them off it's it's one of those things like we we just talked about how the team is gelling well, this is like their second time playing together as center back pairs. They're still they're still behind the re- where the rest of the team performance is. But I've, I've seen enough of both of them as individuals to, to know that once they really develop that chemistry together, they're going to be an amazing pair because they complement each other in their skill sets so well. Where Aiden is more of like a the, the bigger, stronger defender, but also like a downfield passer. Whereas Josh kind of is better with the ball at his feet in, in the dribbling sense. I saw him dribble around into Detroit guys on a couple of occasions, and that impressed me the most. So I think they, they complemented each other so well that I think eventually it'll it'll click. And when it does, I think I think all across our back line is just as as good as we could hope for. That's a good point on the distribution, Jeff, because that's something I noticed was, uh, you know, Adam is just as confident as Aiden in, in his distribution from the back. He just does it a little differently. Um, I've talked about how I like the Shetty and uh, Ty pair because there's kind of like a fire and ice element to it. And, you know, Adam and O'Connor kind of have that same deal, like where they just bring different things to the table and it just complements each other well. And what do, you, what do you call a pair of defenders? Like, do you call them the rock in the hard place? Like, what, <laughs> what do you call them the back but there? The, like, well... A- Aiden is like the rock for sure. I mean, he's just got that build, you know, um, like Alcatraz or Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going more physical boulder, you know, Aiden's the boulder and Adam is the, uh, oh, fuck. I, I got nothing for this one. You're, you're asking too much of me here. Uh, you're sitting here looking like birds just scored a goal, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do it. And they come up on the fly. <laughs> if I did it, I'd be shocked and I'd celebrate like Burge too, because I, I wouldn't see it coming. Um, <laughs> all right. Man of the match. Uh we had a man score a hat trick, so this this will be interesting. Um Luca, who was your man of the match? Uh no doubt, Omar. Three goals. It's impossible not to give him the award. But I think some notable players in there, U- Ty Uziak, he was just unreal running down the right and left wing. And it wasn't just in those two goals that he created. He was the one who gave Trevor Togi a shot on goal. And the amount of times he was just attacking that left center back of, of Inter Detroit was brutal. It was genuinely brutal the way Ty sh- uh, shifted away from, from Omar and made that overlapping run and that diagonal run. That was just extremely dangerous and something that has been working in the last few games that that Josh Oakley really has exploited. Yeah, I felt, I didn't really feel bad for that center back, but just, you know, and and we're what the NBA playoffs are going right now. And in every NBA playoff game, somebody is getting hunted. Like one player, they're trying to put him in every screen, get him on, on a player. And that, that left center back was the guy getting hunted this week. And, it was brutal. It was brutal. Ty absolutely decimated him. Just, just killed him. 
just destroyed him. Dropped uh, him to the floor a couple times as well. Yeah, yeah I, I I had a tweet comparing Ty to Kyrie because he was really putting Thanos Antetokounmpo on the ground constantly. That that was the same deal. I need to bring uh, back the air horn for when you have too many NBA references. <laughs> though, just it's just like the destruction is just like a level you don't see on soccer as much as basketball. Um, Jeff, you're man of the match. Yeah, I, I really wanted to give it to Ty because, like, when I was when I was look when I look up, he is the one like making the flashy play. But I mean, yeah, a guy scores a hat trick, you just have to give it to him. Like, it's it's when, a given. So it's Shetty. But when Jeff really doesn't do when Jeff doesn't do the contrarian take, you know it's it's settled. It's true. I, I do like to spread spread the love a little bit. <laughs> Devil's advocate. Cam, your man of the match. I mean, yeah, uh, Shea scored a hat trick, but really, I just love those clean sheets. So I'm going to give it to Shea. Like, yeah. But there's, <laughs> there's, there, there, you, everyone, there, there's no way that you don't. Um, phenomenal. There, there was a few phenomenal games we've already talked about. Um, Togi tied both, um, but yeah, there, there's you, you can't deny Shetty with the hat trick. Uh, Steve, are you in an agreement? Yeah, I think if we were to do the, the hockey three stars, we would definitely have put probably Togi, Ty, and Shetty, you know, three, two, one, right there. I was up in the press box as we were finishing up the man of the match graphic for social media, and we're like, just delete the poll, it's Shetty. <laughs> well. I had an issue with that poll because Ty somehow didn't end up in it. And I was very upset in the moment. I was very upset, but so I was glad that you guys deleted it because I felt it was disrespectful to Ty. And then one, one more thing I do want to circle back on before we move off this match was the early, um, I guess, early substitution off of Mooney Shirali right before halftime. Um, it kind of took us all a little bit by surprise, but it almost in my head, it was playing out like maybe we thought we had this game in the bag and we wanted to avoid any shit housery on our playmaker, and we took him out before half to keep him safe. Yeah, I think a big part of that was in, was a little bit of tiredness on the legs there. You could we could see Cam and I could see Moody Shirali on the sideline after he got subbed off. He was just rolling out his legs, rolling out his thighs, and it really did seem us like a sense of tiredness around his legs. So I think it was I think it was an important move for oaks to pull him off if he's not fully fit and a two goals up and oaks has shown he's very cognizant of that and uh has shown several times that he's not willing to you know make the risky play with these guys if they've been playing or if they're a little hurt um but yeah my man of the match was shetty but yeah i really like up until that third goal honestly i did have tie i was still going tie the assist the force beast pk that should have been assist and then he won up the oh good old zoom maybe weston will come back maybe he won't stay That's tuned a great uh, ha- happened to me not that long ago right now yeah you just look like john stamos he looks like fucking <laughs> <laughs> that face he's frozen in is <laughs> all, right. all right who takes over for weston's uh weekend preview well, while we remain, while we await his dramatic return, we do have two road matches coming up this weekend. Oh, hold on, I gotta switch the video. Please. <laughs> I can hear me again. Back. I'm back. Thank God. Um, yeah, Shetty was my pick. So Shetty wins unanimous. Props to Shetty. Uh, first Lansing men's hat trick since 2014. Uh, Lansing United had two in their first year. And we did some research. We even reached out to Jeremy Sampson to see if he knew of any others. Uh, there were none. At least no anybody knew of. So it's it, that's the first hat trick in almost seven years for Lansing men's club soccer. So props shout to out, Shetty. Shout out Brian Cunningham. Brian Cun- and uh, Matt Brown. Those are the other two men's uh, players who have who have done it. A couple on the Lansing United women's side. Um, in recent years, I think it was Shirebeek and uh, Buck, who, who are the two that have done it for United Women. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, all right, so this is a huge weekend, folks. Once again, there's a question later from Ken in the Ken bag um, that is about must-win games, but these two are, games are very important. I'll just say that. 
first one is this Friday against the Michigan Stars, a team just really thinks the game's played, is, is at the top of the table right now. Uh, but they've had some good wins. They played Detroit, I believe, tougher than anybody else has. They only lost to them 2-1. to one. Uh, So they're, they're sitting at 4-1-1. One, and one. I haven't been able to watch them personally yet, but while the record is scary, I think we're good enough to take them on. Uh, the Stars' four wins are all against Livonia or LK St. Clair, who are at the bottom of the table. So um, I believe they tied Inter, and then they lost to Detroit. So, And that Detroit team, was, I mean, their, their loss to Detroit is probably their most impressive performance in terms of score thus far. But this is a game we can win, even on the road. Um, and then after that, it is Sunday, away on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock. That's rough. That is rough. Um, but Livonia just lost 4 nothing to BIH. They're not – that's a, a way, whatever, it's a game we need to win. Uh, so the thing I'm interested in here, it's two games in three days. Not the first time this will happen this season. Um, in an article recently, Oak said he thinks the squad has, like, roughly 20 good players. So that's, that's a lot of players. Um, and this is the kind of weekend where you need 20 good players. It's where you tap into that depth. Uh, Luca, you probably have the best insight into this team in terms of the depth. Who's a player we haven't discussed much on this pod yet that you think will play important minutes this weekend? For me personally, one that gave a phenomenal game and then went unheard of in the last game was Lutrim Shafku. Played all 90 minutes, controlled the ball really well, dominated the midfield. And I think coming up in these two games, Oaks is looking for him to be the leader. He got handed the captain's armband towards the end of the game and it just shows the the type of trust this team has on him and even though he's not an out now goal scorer or an assisting machine he's a guy who can keep the pace and he's really the metronome of this team when he wants to and I think he will have huge minutes this game and his and for his brother I think if he can come back into this team since he was left out of inner Detroit if he can come out and give two good games this weekend I think he'll earn significant minutes going forward. Yeah, Liram is a guy we haven't seen as much of after the opening few games. So, um, you know, this kind of schedule, we could be counting on him here. Uh, Jeff, who, who who's someone we haven't talked about that you think we're going to be talking about I, after this weekend? I'm just thinking of the, the forward depth. So far, Shetty's been doing a good, good job staying on the field. And I think I think he has he has two games – in, in three days in him, but I, again, going back to kind of what Oaks has said, he doesn't want to force it. So I think uh, I would like to see Rosendale or Ben Meshke, one of the two, they'll probably both, both uh, see, see time. I would like to see one, at least one of them uh, get on the, get on the score sheet um, this weekend and, and really kind of step up in the, in the striker role just to provide a little more depth so we're not relying on, on Shetty and Ty this weekend and then down the stretch. Yeah, based off the sub patterns we've seen from Oaks, I'm kind of thinking we're going to see maybe a similar starting lineup both games, but the first game, some guys will get subbed after 30 minutes, and then the second game, maybe some of the guys who played more in the first game get subbed quick. So I, I, Oaks has shown a willingness to – make those subs early, especially with this cadet schedule. Um, Cam, any, any other thoughts there? I missed uh, the first half of comments because uh, there was a dog issue. So can you repeat <laughs> my question? We, we were talking about someone we haven't talked about as much that, you know, based on friendlies or whoever, wherever else you think will play an impact this weekend. Depends on how much we think we've not talked about somebody. Maybe Silva or Bure. Okay. It's, it's my, my yeah. thought. I mean, I'll I'll say we haven't talked about Togi much until this pod. So I I, I think Togi starts at least one of these two games. I, I think he earned it. I mean, I think Esteban's been excellent for the most part. So, I mean, I expect to see plenty of him too. But I think Togi starts a game, and I, I think – I think he's earned it. I mean, uh, his performance was excellent, but I do wonder if he's the kind of guy that works better in those condensed minutes because he can truly give that that burst of energy um, to a team that is maybe tired. So um, we'll see, but that, that's who I'm calling out. Um, and for anyone interested in coming, uh, 
Friday night in Washington, Michigan. Um, Art and Jake's bar right across from the Star Stadium. Around 5 to 5.30, a lot of people who are coming to the game will be hanging out there. So if you want, if you're kind of making the trip and you want to hang out and pregame a little bit, that's going to be the spot. It's right across from the Star Sports Center. So very convenient. It'll be a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun before Enter Detroit um, doing something similar. I just want to chime in because, you know, as being one of those names that was left out from the last question, I'm going to put in another name that we've left out because we didn't see him last Sunday was Marco Bernardini. I wouldn't be mm-hmm. surprised to see him in a central role, either starting or subbing in just to, you know, fill in for fatigue or to start one of those matches. That is the uh, man who won a match, man of the match vote from a, me and I believe you in the Fort Wayne match. That's right. So th- that's a good call out. Um, all right. We got some, we got some great questions, mostly thanks to Ken. So thanks Ken. But some others chipped in too. So appreciate it. Uh, Ken asked, how did you wrangle uh, Matt Chartow into doing the PA again? And should he do a goal call when the Robins score? Um, I thought, I thought the, the Chartow thing was a one-time thing. So how do you put there, Steve? Yeah. So our, our regular PA announcer, Ian had a prior commitment for last Sunday. It was his only commitment for the duration of the season. So we brought Matt back. Um, he he was happy to do it. We reached out to him because he did call our first game for us. Um, so that's why we brought him in because he had, he had already done it. And that was the one time we needed him to fill in. And if it comes up again, we'll call on him again. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly give his reel to Ian and say, Hey, you want to go over the top for some of your stuff too? Because Matt's really happy to do that. <laughs> Matt is excellent as the PA announcer. I, I do. I don't like too many people being taken away from the supporter section is my only issue with it, but he's excellent. And if it makes him happy, then it makes him happy. You know, what, I, what am I going to do? I do want to call the back. The goal call is legit amazing. I love, yes. I love it. It's, I, it's energy. It's not just goal name. Like he, 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 he makes it an event kind of thing. And I like that. No, he does I, have a theatrical voice that just gets you pumped. <laughs> he, good. Props to Matt. Absolutely. Um, Ken asks, getting into the heart of the season and key games. For me, a question for me, that doesn't happen too often. I'm usually forgotten about. Nobody wants to ask me questions. Um, what's the expected must-win games, you call the XMWG, for the Robins to challenge for the East title? Well, I'll be honest. I think we – so it all will depend a lot on how things go against Detroit City. But as we suspected – um, Detroit City obviously was able to recruit well because they have a pro team. And if you're a college player who's interested in going to pro, yeah, it seems pretty smart to jump onto their U23 team and then hope you just get like the call what up. They said when joining the league that they would do. Yeah. <laughs> as as uh, you brought up when when they first joined, but yeah, they they obviously have like a strong USL League Two team. Um, so when we played Kalamazoo, they're actually at the top of their division in USL League 2. They're a very good team that we competed with. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if Detroit is right around that level, that KZ level. So I'm not sure how many games they're going to lose because, you know, they just beat down the Bearings, who was a team we were kind of hoping would be good. Um, BIH is starting to show something. Maybe they can knock them down a peg. Uh, Stars obviously played them tough. But my main point is, not a lot of losses I'm expecting for Detroit. So that's why I've been so like must win game, must win game. Cause there's no playoffs and Detroit looks really good. So I would say we probably have to win all, but one of the rest of our games and we definitely have to win the games against Detroit as, as things stand right now. I, I really feel that way. Cause I just don't, I don't think a lot of these teams are going to challenge them, but I do think we can. Uh, Jordan Stoddard with two questions for Luca. Uh, this is going – so for those who don't know, Luca also covers uh, MSU soccer for Impact. Uh, what are your thoughts on the hiring of Jeff Hosler? I hope I got that right, by uh, MSU Women's Soccer. Oh, I think it's an excellent appointment. I talked to a couple scouts a couple days ago and talked to them about, um, about Jeff and how his team – he has an impressive resume. Three D2 national titles in seven years – with the late with the GVSU Lakers, I think that's phenomenal because in college soccer you lose players every year and you're gonna lose key players. So the fact that you can go three in seven years is 
an incredible achievement. And he's going to be replacing a Tom Saxton, who's coached at MSU women's soccer for 30 years. And in the last two seasons, this team went one, nine and one consecutively. And they were in need of something of some refreshments of some energy and really some different recruitment styles that to move forward the program. I think it's an, I think it's an excellent, I think it's an excellent hire. And I've heard from a lot of people that this, this hiring will not go down as a mistake. Yeah, it was a home run. Sorry to jump in there, but uh, it, as someone who's, who's attended many a, uh, a MSU women's soccer games in the past and kind of through summer soccer, getting to see the individual talent levels of the players who are on that roster. I, they, they massively underachieved in the last several seasons. Um, so like, like Lucas said, someone with fresh blood and fresh ideas. Um, I, I think they can, if he can, I think he, even if he maintains and, and maybe even raises it just a little bit on the recruiting level, I, I still think they recruit good players and have good talent yeah. in the program. I think he's just getting more out of them. I think is what you, you can see it. I think the turnaround could be pretty quick for, for MSG. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jeff. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many times we've seen s- so many great performances by MSU, but they were just beaten in the last 10, 15 minutes of the game. And you have star players like Gio Wahlberg, Cameron Evans, Paige Weber, uh, girls who have just come into this program and are some of the best in the country, not just the Big Ten, but really star, a star-studded squad. Wahlberg in the 2019 season, I believe, scored nine goals and was the top one of the top scorers in the nation. She That firepower in that team is there already. So as long as they can tune that team up and get them playing in a way that they can become more dangerous and grind out games against some of the tougher teams in the Big Ten, they'll have a great season. Yeah, I, I don't follow college soccer, but I will say every time I look at the MSU women record, I'm really stunned because every MSU women's player that plays for Lansing United is excellent. So it's it's really weird. <laughs> I, 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 I'm like, why are they so bad? Like, why is every player that comes up to Lansing United good? It doesn't make sense. So uh, I, I think those are good points there. Um, Jordan also asked uh, how uh, if there's any incoming players you're excited about for MSU men's soccer, Luca. Well, I'll tell you two right now that are on this team, Zach Kelly we go. and Josh Adam, <laughs> two guys that I've raved about to my colleagues over the last few weeks because I get to see them. I get to see these guys play and in training. And I said, wow, these guys are truly excellent. And they're both 18, 19 years old. It's unbelievable what they're doing at this level. And they're going to be the future of this Michigan State Spartan side. And again, you have other guys coming in, Zach Babiak from Varner Academy. I've heard good things about him too. Tall center forward can play the nine or 10 position. And we know Damon Rensing loves to pick out his forwards and he loves his center backs. And that's why I think Josh Adams is going to be one of the highlighted names in this team, simply because look at how they've recruited center backs in the past years. They brought in Nick Stone, who is playing currently for the Detroit city under 23 side and Luke Morrell, uh, who's a, I believe was a transfer to Michigan state last season. That set that center back part that center back pairing last season was one of the best we've ever seen. Uh, another question for you, Luca, from Ken. What is your soccer background, and did you play growing up? And what teams did you follow? So going for the first two questions, yes, I grew up playing soccer a lot. I played at the DA level in Southern California since I was eleven years old. Um, fun fact, I actually debuted at the seventh division of professional soccer in Italy for a team that I played with over the summer that they gave me a summer, they, they gave me a summer contract and wanted me to stay, but I was not quite ready to move away across the country from San, from San Diego to Italy. And for the, for the seventh division, it was not something that seemed fit for me. I wasn't ready to give up a whole career yet. Um, and the teams that I follow, I'm a huge AC Milan fan and in England, of course, I support Tottenham Hotspur. Oh, wow. How how does this pod attract every Spurs fan? (laughs) It's unbelievable. I'm by idiots. Yeah, literally everybody you're talking to, because yeah, even behind the scenes, Steve is Spurs. That's pretty amazing. 
I mean, come on, um, Jeff. Even Liverpool, Liverpool fans... wins like twice in 20 years, and all of a sudden you weren't in purgatory for two decades of your life. Seriously, Balotelli headlined Liverpool for like how many years now? Too many. Too many. <laughs> uh, the coffee firm, the coffee based supporter group, which has to be the only in American soccer. I'm going to say that. I'm going to boldly say that they're the only coffee supporter group. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they asked, of all the soccer trophies in the world, where does the extra caffeinated trophy rank, and why is it number one? That's the trophy the coffee germ has been given out to a player every week uh, after the game. Can, can I give a hot is take it? here? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hot, hot coffee take? Like yeah, that, that, was, that was what I was playing off. Yeah, that's that's what I was playing off of. Um, I didn't even know. You didn't put it in the outline, so I, I couldn't tell. Yeah, um, I, are they giving this – is it a new trophy ever? Is it – is the same trophy they just let them take a picture with every week. Um, that's a great point. Like, do they expect it goes them? home with Ken? It goes home with Ken. All right. Well, then I'm going to so say it ranks, it ranks a few. Photo of the, what up, Concacaf Nations uh, Nations League Cup? It's it's probably 18 spots above that piece of trash. Okay, come on. We I mean, were all pretty pumped. Like it was made out of foam. I I couldn't imagine supporting a soccer team that hasn't won the Concacaf Nations Cup. That's all I'm saying. Um, I mean, a the the fact that they don't keep it is rough. That's rough. It's for a photo op, and then it's stripped from them. Like, give it to them, let them keep it for a week, guys. Come on. Two live man of the matches are often very flawed, especially from the supporter section when you have a very clear view of certain people, not of others. I don't, you know. So I give them props for what they're doing for the co- the coffee firm, just putting an insane amount of content out. Ken is coming for my my journalism in Lansing title, soccer journalism title. Your he, self he wants to title. Yes, my self episode title. He wants to take me out. I could tell with these interviews with other coaches. He's prepping. He's preparing. He's practicing. Uh, so I see what you're doing, Ken. You're trying to take me out, and I'm not going to stand for it. <laughs> that was pretty harsh for what seems like a pretty fun, cool idea for lower league soccer. <laughs> it's fun. Okay. Good this for is you, Ken. His ego, Cam. This is that's why he's so defensive. It's his ego. <laughs> Look, fragile must be Italian. Uh, well, for that question to this one, this is quite a change. Oh well, no, we have one other question first. Uh, Josh, uh, board member Josh asked Jeff's for Jeff's thoughts on the new U.S. soccer kit. It's an all right training top. It's not a great uh, kit. It's a recycled graphic design trope in U.S. colors, and yeah, it's not wholly original. It is. It is an upgrade over the last dark kit they had with the weird, like amorphous blob river thing. But that's not saying much. Uh, Josh also notes that I took myself out by moving. It's true, but I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> It just makes it easier to go to road games because, you know, I'm just the ultimate road warrior now because almost every team we play is in Metro Detroit. Um, Sterling G- Heights journalists. There we go. <laughs> All that Sterling, that Sterling Heights soccer team is, is hot, I got to say, except it's not. Uh, Josh also asked on a, on a more serious note, um, Lancet community was hit by several shootings this week, uh, several deaths. Um, he was wondering – your guys' thoughts, mostly he's talking about board members here because he wants to know your thoughts and then the role that uh, Lancet Common can play in building a better community and fostering a positive experience for youth. Um, we were talking a bit about before the pod, and I think Steve had some thoughts here. Yeah, we'll take the left turn. Um, so a lot of the contributions to kind of social and neighborhood anxiety that may have been coming up have been contributing to some of the recent acts of violence around the Lansing area, mostly concentrated in the city center. Um, And there have been various articles from different outlets like the Lansing State Journal saying how mentoring programs were short-circuited last year because of COVID. When students were getting paired up with older people from the community, they couldn't do that in person anymore. And their school life got flipped upside down and jobs were being lost and there's anxiety that comes with that. Um, so I think a lot of things that we can do is kind of help out and support those mentoring programs around the city. We can also make those opportunities for their athletes, um, you know, come watch practice, um, have something else to do as part of your day. 
Um, so we can certainly start building on the foundation that's been laid by those community organizations and see what we can do to partner with them. Yeah, we've had at, at work, it, it's been the topic of conversation for the last couple of days is just like, where do we, where do we go from here? It, it just seems like a, a lot of it is, it seems people are disconnected because um, it, it turns out people have been kind of digging into the situations with, between some of the, some of the victims and some of the alleged like assailants and stuff. And it's stems from like misunderstandings on social media is, is literally to blame for at least one of them. It's just, people just need to be in a same, the same spaces again and in a community again. And I think community is the, is the base of what we are trying to be as a club. It's literally the root of our name. So just being a place where people can go, go and just, hang out for a, a couple hours and I don't I don't know how we foster conversation in the stance between you know people or whatever but just getting people to you know interact again and and make face-to-face -face connections with people and I think that that that's that's a good first step in, in what we can kind of provide for the community I think that's a good point Jeff um so this is not just a Lansing problem. This is something that's happening all over. And um, a lot of this spike happened, you know, right around COVID. And, you know, so there's some pretty obvious reasons for that. So, um, you know, build, building a, you know, positive community experience, uh, the more of those, the better for any community. So um, I think there's a lot Lansing can do to, Lansing Common can do to help with that for sure. Um, Matt Sharta, who we talked about earlier, had a... Uh, didn't have a question, just had a comment. Um, the PA announcer we talked about earlier, he said, I just want to give major props to the play-by-play -play guys. The team is so new that the um, that in the booth I was constantly asking, all right, who is that? When I can't see their number, I've watched the broadcast and I'm really impressed with how well they already know the players. I'll throw that in too, Luca. Um, I, I've said that pretty early on in this pod. You guys have done an amazing job. And like from the first broadcast, I was – you know, I, I do a fair bit of research for this pod and I was blown away by how much I was learning from you guys, just broadcasting all the prep work you guys do. So I appreciate that immensely. You know, every day uh, Cam and I are learning and we're learning on the job and we really prepared as much as we can to give a broadcast and really help grow this club as much as we can and as well as ourselves. So I appreciate all the feedback and thank you for everything really. And final question was to me from Eric Walcott, the Prez. He asked, what made you the happiest this week? Uh, well, for me, this is, uh, if you've been following this pod for a long time, well, not this pod, but the exploits of me and Cam, you might know the significance of this, but Cam, so you know, the thing that made me happy this week is that uh, Carolyn I get, is pregnant and I saw yes! the ultrasound for the first time. <laughs> So I'm glad you went that way because I thought that uh, wasn't your anniversary possibly recently. Uh, somewhat recently, yeah. Like within the last week, though. Yeah, it's a couple weeks. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I. I uh, if, if it had been this week and you hadn't mentioned something, I, I don't need to get too in the weeds. I'm I'm real excited right now. <laughs> this and no mean. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's why I saved it for live in the pot. I'm glad you're able to make it. That's so yeah. That's it for this week. Uh, before we go, uh, once again, Pride Night coming up on the 26th. So make sure you check that out. Also, new Robin shirt on, on the shop. It's it's a dry fit, Jeff. It is. Um, we'll actually have another dry fit coming out soon. It wasn't quite ready, but uh, the, Rob, the Robin dry fit. Uh, it's a new, new screen print uh, design, and it's on a nice lightweight material perfect for your summer blazing soccer needs um so yeah I, i'm excited sold well at the first game so let's just keep that going i'm on it i'm buying it soon um once again too if you're if you're coming out to uh washington for the stars game meet us at art and jakes before the game in washington um but yeah that is it for this week uh, we'll have two road games to talk about next week it's gonna be fun hopefully we're talking about two wins 
Um, Steve, thanks for always for everything you do. Jeff, thanks for joining. And Luca, thanks for joining. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll have you on again soon. Thank you. Make sure to replay my reaction for Carolyn. Yeah, well, she she's right here. But we'll talk after the after we close out here. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks again for everyone for watching.